Welcome to Eco-Friendly Homes, your go-to podcast for learning all things healthy, efficient, and eco-friendly in your home. I'm your host, Madison Hopkins, and I'm so thankful that you're here with me today. I'm a certified green real estate agent in Denver, Colorado, helping you live more sustainably by sharing tangible steps each month on how to reduce your home's emissions, save money, buy cleaner, build greener, and to discuss what an eco-friendly home could and does look like. If you're ready to work with me as your Denver-based real estate agent, email me, madison at movingwithmadison.com. And remember to hit subscribe so you can get notified every second and fourth Wednesday of the month when I release an episode on how to live more eco-friendly in your home. Now sit back, relax, grab your favorite tea, have one of your favorite cookies, and enjoy the show. This podcast episode is sponsored by Millennium Mortgage, your lending solutions for the place you call home. Hey, podcast listeners, and thanks for tuning back in to today's show of Eco-Friendly Homes. And in our Eco-Friendly Home today, we are talking about composting, and I am a huge fan of composting, and our guest speaker here today, Alexa Rosenstein, is also a huge fan of composting, as she is the Director of Operations for Scraps, and Scraps is a really well-known, very official composting service in our Mile High City of Denver and the surrounding areas. So nice to meet you. Alexa, and thanks for being on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to talk about composting and, and just share some, some tips and tricks for people. Yeah. So is Scraps the like official composting service of like our governments and surrounding cities? Because I know that cities will pick it up themselves, but y'all are like associated with, with so many different cities in our surrounding area. Yeah. So if you are a resident in Denver and you live in a single family home or a condo slash apartment building with seven units or fewer, you can actually take advantage of the municipal program. So the city government of Denver provides a compost collection service for residents. Scraps is not affiliated with that program. And we actually came about as a result of the shortcomings of that program and not to diss the city's efforts or anything like that, but the limitation um, that they have for that seven units or fewer pretty obviously excludes a lot of apartment buildings. We live in a city, of course, so there's hundreds of apartment buildings that are much larger than seven units. And that's really when we decided that we needed to come in and, and do what we can to kind of serve those people who did not have access to the city's program. On top of that, the city's program is not, you're not able to participate if you are a business of any kind. So that is offices, restaurants, cafes, all sorts of businesses. So that was really our our impetus for, for getting started to service residents and businesses all across the city. Nice. Well, yeah, you're so right that that's like a huge gap, seven or less, because I mean... <laughs> I don't think I've ever lived in an apartment or a house that has qualified for the government's program yet. And so that's, and I, you know, I, I'm in real estate, so I help clients buy a variety of houses. I have a friend who bought a condo. I just helped a buyer buy in a townhouse, but I don't know what the town, I think his does qualify because I think he has five in his row, but then it's like a larger complex and there's five in the other row, but they do have the composting like waste bins in the back alley that the government would come and pick or the city would come and pick up. But scraps is, has really been amazing for us so far. I know you and I were emailing a little bit back and forth when I started with scraps and I was nervous about y'all's bin type because I had only worked or used composting in my apartment once before with a different service who doesn't service in Jefferson County. And they were great too, but it had like a, a different lid. So I was a little bit nervous about that, but I actually just keep it outside on our patio and we use smaller composting baggies instead of like, mm-hmm. like a three gallon bag. We use just like small ones. And then, so mm-hmm. I put maybe like six of them in there every week. So it gets pretty full. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's really great. I actually didn't know that much about composting before I moved to Denver and started working for scraps. And now I've been here three and a half years or something around there. And 
now I feel somewhat of an expert when it comes to collection, at least. And I have one of our bins at my house. It's interesting because different, you know, tips and practices work for different types of people. But the one that you mentioned is really common where instead of having one bag in the bin, because scraps only comes once per week for our residential members, you can do multiple bags, tie them off. It's, it's, not cold outside in the winter, it's really great to to put the bin out on your patio where it just freezes and it's, you know, good to go. There's no smell, there's no moisture. Um, in the summer to kind of replicate that same scenario, we always recommend people try to keep your bin or maybe your smaller bags in the freezer between pickups. That really helps, like I said, keep things contained, no smell, no mess. So there's a handful of little things that can really help you get from week to week. And some people really, their compost doesn't smell at all. So it kind of just depends on what you're eating, what you're throwing in there, moisture content, all sorts of stuff like that. But that's our goal to just make it pretty simple. And aside from moving your scraps from what you would be throwing in the trash into a separate bin, we handle the collection. We handle all the messy stuff. Um, You just set out your bin, we empty it and that's it. Yeah, you usually come to my house and pick up pretty early. I see the guy in his truck with all the other composting bags. And I, I wanted to ask him before if he would pick up our Christmas tree too, but I missed him because he's so quick and early. <laughs> we do do Christmas trees. This is the first year that we tried to put it out there. We tried to get our larger apartments so that we could get more trees in one pickup. But it's something that we're exploring. Christmas trees, yard waste we do like pumpkins around Halloween and stuff like that. So that is an expanding area of the business for sure. Simple side note. I actually did not carve a pumpkin this year. We have a vertical tower garden and my boyfriend and I, we grew pumpkins on the tower garden. And so we actually, they're like a Japanese type of pumpkin. They're really small. They're like a sweet pumpkin. They're really tasty. You can eat the skin. So I did not carve and waste a pumpkin. I actually ate my Halloween pumpkin and it's, it was really awesome. Yeah. But for people, you, you brought up a good point. Like you didn't, you weren't super familiar with composting before you moved to Denver. And I sort of have this luxury where I've known what composting is since I did this program in the Island school. And that's what it was called. The Island school is in Eleuthera in the Bahamas. If anyone's out there listening and you're in high school, definitely check out the Island school in the Bahamas because it is well worth going to. And so I went for six weeks and they have semester long programs, but I did the summer program and they taught us so much about like local ecology and eating local. I also got my first introduction towards like veganism there because they showed us the movie Food Inc. <laughs> Yep, that'll do it. <laughs> yeah, that will do it. Um, which I'm not, I'm not vegetarian or vegan anymore. I did give it a good shot for a little while though, but that we also learned about composting. And so after every meal, we would go over and we would scrape all of our food remains into the compost, really large trash place. And they showed us the whole cycle of it too. Like this is what more composted or more de- decomposed food looks like. And then it eventually turns into soil. And I know a lot of people like to use it for their house plants, for their home gardens. I I have very few amount of house plants, so they don't get any of my compost. But so yeah, like there's so much to unpack here for people who do not know what composting is. So first off, like what is compost? Yes, fantastic question. The way that I like to describe it that I think is the easiest to conceptualize is in the same way that we recycle our aluminum cans and glass bottles and cardboard, and we turn those into more paper, glass, and aluminum products, we can actually recycle our organic waste and turn it into compost. So like you said, instead of sending our food scraps to the landfill, which maybe we can get into a little bit more, composting them actually essentially gives them another life. Um, and turns them into this new product that is really beneficial for houseplants, gardens, agriculture on a large scale, and it has myriad benefits. It helps our soils retain moisture, which especially in Colorado is important because we have wildflowers and it's wildflowers, wildfires, wildfires, and just drought. It's a super dry climate. So Composting is organic recycling. You can take anything that was once alive, 
that's, you know, fruit and vegetable peelings, maybe a houseplant that didn't quite make it, even trimming from your lawn, grass clippings or twigs. Same as with animal products. This one is has a little bit of a caveat because you can't as easily compost animal products if you compost at home with, say, a backyard tumbler or something like that. But if you utilize an industrial composting facility, which is what Scraps provides, we can accept all of those animal products. And again, maybe that's something we can dive into more in a little bit. But taking all of those scraps, all of those uneaten peels and pits and bones, getting that through the composting process turns into finished compost, and then we can use it apply it on our soils, et cetera. And like I said, give it kind of a new life. You actually said the brand's name in that sentence. I don't know if you caught that, but you said taking the scraps. (laughs) Yeah, taking the scraps. It was. (laughs) Uh, Very seamlessly done as well. Thank you. (laughs) So yeah, there's some really cool things, a few, a few directions we could go in here. And First off, so you said the industrial composting. So Scraps is actually the first composting program I've ever used. And Denver has many to choose from, many, you know, go compost no matter what. Like, do not ignore it just because you prefer one brand over the other. Just get a compost service pickup. But Scraps has actually been really amazing because y'all allow like meat products and dairy products where, and I guess that's where the industrial composting comes in because you can take more of those, those animal products. And I did, I think I also asked you in our email, do y'all allow dog poop? And the answer was no, (laughs) but chicken bones, like dairy products. And that's kind of, that's really uncommon. Yeah, it is. I think that thankfully it is becoming more common as municipalities like Denver and just small businesses like Scraps start to pop up around the country. I think organic waste is becoming uh, more on the forefront of people's minds. A little side note here, 40 to 50% of what we Americans send to the landfill in our trash is compostable waste. It's food waste primarily, and then like paper products. So 40% of what we're sending to the landfill has the potential to not be sent to the landfill and to be composted. Instead, the Northeast is physically running out of space for landfill. So this is really kind of top of mind for them. Outside of, you know, that problem, it's also the right thing to do for various reasons. So yeah, I would say that businesses like us are, are popping up and utilizing industrial facilities is really from my perspective, the future, especially if this is going to scale, this is not to say that if you're composting in your backyard, absolutely keep that up. It's fantastic. Especially if you are maybe an avid gardener or you just, you know, have a lot going on in your backyard and, and you have trimmings and clippings often, it's great to have your own pile that you can kind of, you know, brew yourself essentially. And then you have a finished product that you can use. However, like you mentioned, if you are you know, a meat eater, animal products, um, eggshells can be tough to break down in your home pile, same with citrus, all that stuff. Or if you're someone like me who doesn't necessarily want to spend time in the backyard turning my food waste into piles and and doing all that work, that's where, you know, a service like ours comes in. So industrial facilities, we actually, the compost that we pick up at Scraps is taken to a local facility called A1 Organics. They're super well known in the composting industry. They're kind of the original and I think maybe the largest industrial facility on the Rocky Mountain region. Um, And what makes them industrial, I actually don't know too, too much about the science, but I have been to their facility, taken tours, um, and we work relatively closely with their team. They are just processing compost on a scale that is almost hard to imagine. They have dozens and dozens of rows of compost that are 100, 200 yards long, you know, six or seven feet high, just full of compost. And they have, of course, machinery that can process that. And they are able to, because they're so closely monitoring essentially the status of these piles, and because, you know, everyone who works there is is much more intelligent uh, than I am when it comes to the science of how composting works and all the microorganisms that work. They are able to, I guess, 
what's the right word, to get those piles up to a high enough temperature for a certain amount of time, that is really, really difficult to do in your backyard on a small scale. Right. So it's really temperature, time frame, I know uh, that are two really important factors when it comes to industrial composting. Those things allow for the breakdown of things like meat and bones, um, industrially compostable, like plastic products, if, if anyone has ever come across you know, a utensil or a cup that's compostable. Right. Like um, a plant-based composting utensil or like a dog poop bag, since I mentioned that earlier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Those things are not going to break down in your backyard, but they will break down in this industrial setting. Hey, y'all, Madison Hopkins here. Shameless plug. Do you know that I'm a certified green real estate agent in Denver, Colorado? Well, I am, and I'm here to give you the inside scoop on buying and selling in Denver and why the winter is a really great time to buy. Denver has been in a really long-term seller's market. In December 2021, Denver had three weeks supply worth of inventory, and our market imbalance across the country is six months supply. So we're in an extreme seller's market right now. So how does this work with buying in the winter? Well, essentially, if you can be lenient on what kind of property you buy or the features in the house, this is a really good time for you, whether you're a buyer or a seller becoming a buyer again. For buyers, this is great because you have less competition than you would in the summer when most people are trying to buy and the competition is a lot stronger. Now, if you're a seller in Denver, also looking to buy in Denver, you have a nice little balanced time of year. So that way you can still sell your house for top dollar. You can still have great competition on your asking price, but you also have a little bit less competition when you become a buyer into your next house. My name is Madison Hopkins. My contact information is in the caption and I'm a certified green real estate agent in Denver. Hopefully you found this inside scoop helpful and I will see y'all next time. So I did not realize that you and I were going to be getting into the science about composting today. I just didn't like think that we would get here, but I'm really glad that we are because you brought up some really good points that like the difference really between industrial composting and backyard composting or like even community garden composting is the technology and the science that they're able to use to speed up the composting process. And so I don't know how long like backyard composting or um, community garden composting generally takes, but you also said, you know, if you leave your bin outside during the winter, that's fine. It will freeze and we'll have any smell or you can put it in the freezer. So it kind of goes like that, that whole picture is sort of painted right now, you know, like you're not going to be able to compost as well in your backyard in Colorado because it's going to freeze for what, five months out of the year. Yeah, and then, so... and then, and then just the industrial composting, having that technology to like, I assuming they're also like compressing the food together to kind of generate more heat, like internally and like maybe also have heat radiating onto it, but I have seen composting at home, like machines that you can put on your countertops. And so you don't have to have like a compost collection service. You can just put all your food waste, your food scraps into this at home composting machine. And it takes like about a week to turn it into nutrient rich soil that you can then use in your garden or your house plants. So I think that's super interesting. It is interesting. And this is, I, I feel like I know about some of this and some of it is still like amazing and a bit confusing to me. So one thing is, so composting itself, as we mentioned, is like organics recycling. You're turning your scraps into this finished soil amendment. The process of, of scraps turning into, here I am plugging scraps again, on, inadvertently. Um, yeah, yeah, go turning, ahead. It's great. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you for scraps for being here on the podcast today. Yeah. <laughs> I'll keep reminding everyone. And so the, the process of turning your food waste into compost is, it is all due to the microbial activity that goes down. So there are certain bacteria and organisms that facilitate the decomposition of our food waste and turn it into food scraps. So essentially by ingesting the nutrients and stuff from our food waste, their like excretions are what compost is. 
and that sounds maybe a little bit gross, but these things are just absolutely microscopic, tiny, tiny organisms. And compost itself is full of life. There is, if you take a teaspoon or a tablespoon of finished compost, meaning that everything has been broken down and, and we have the final product, in that teaspoon of compost, there are more organisms than there are human beings on the planet. So there is so, so much activity going on in a compost pile. Um, and you actually can compost in extremely cold temperatures. There are some methods to, to doing this. You have to, it also, you know, depends on your climate, et cetera, but keeping the pile covered is one thing to do. And also turning it is really important. Again, this is not necessarily what we at Scraps do because we are a hauler, but if you compost at home or if you're curious about what goes on at the facility, what goes on inside of a compost pile, that is it. So if you have your Scraps bucket out for pickup, like you said, you leave it on your patio and it's, you know, it's February here, so it's going to freeze overnight. Those are not going to, anything in there is not going to start breaking down because we haven't given it a chance to essentially let those organisms come to life and start decomposing that stuff. When you put those food scraps into a compost pile, there are organisms at play. So you need that, that life, those bacteria, those organisms, you need air. So that's why compost tumblers, you have to turn them. Or if you have a, a static pile on the ground, you have to turn it physically with like a pitchfork. You have to have air in the pile so that those organisms can, can breathe essentially. And then you have to have moisture. So those are kind of the, the three requirements for a compost pile. If you're not turning your compost, essentially if you're letting it sit out on your patio, if there's no moisture and if those organisms can't survive, then that's, nothing's gonna happen. Um, so at the industrial facility, they actually kind of the opposite of what you mentioned, instead of kind of compressing the food waste to, to generate heat, it's the opposite. We want to infuse air into it because maybe not, not to get too granular, but this is really important when it comes to the distinction between landfill, a landfill environment and a composting environment. I love um, the granular things. I, I love that stuff. Very small cool. details that like no one ever blogs about, but I love that kind of yeah. stuff. Cool. Okay. So what's important here is, like I mentioned, these, these microbes. Certain bacteria and microbes exist in what's called an anaerobic environment. That means there's no air, no oxygen present versus an aerobic environment where there is air. That aerobic environment is corresponds to composting. As I mentioned, we have to turn the piles. We have to make sure that they're getting air and that they're moist enough so that these organisms can thrive. In a landfill, this is actually, I think, one of the most fascinating things that I first learned when I delved into the world of composting. There's actually a fantastic documentary. It's called Wasted. It used to be on Netflix. I hope it still is. Super awesome. It's all about food waste and it goes into composting a little bit. Highly recommend. Anywho, in that documentary, I heard this statistic that just absolutely blew my mind. I, I was just like, that cannot be true. So the fact was, if you take a head of lettuce, you put that head of lettuce in a landfill, and then you take, you know, a similar head of lettuce, put it in a compost pile. The head of lettuce that went to the landfill will not break down for 25 or more years. It will take that long, and it might not even fully break down at that point. That head of lettuce in a compost pile will break down in a matter of weeks. And when it's finished, we will have this beautiful finished compost product. So in a landfill, as I mentioned earlier, we have an anaerobic environment. There's no air. So there, the bacteria that exist in a compost pile do not also exist in a landfill. They're basically completely different. Um, and without those bacteria, things do not break down. So landfills, when we send our food waste there, when we send anything there, it's essentially entombed, which sounds a little bit weird, but nothing is decomposing because the life of these microbial organisms that are required to do the decomposing, they can't exist there. That's a little bit of, I guess, an, an overview of, of one of the main differences between composting and, and landfilling, but we need air, we need water, and we need those organisms to do their work in breaking down our food waste. 
and and creating compost as essentially a very wonderful byproduct of their digestion, for lack of a better term. Do you know the history of why we started creating landfills? Oh my gosh. Part of me, I was about to say, I wish I did. And then I realized, I wish, I'm kind of glad I don't because I'm sure it's the history that of, you know, why we use so many fossil fuels and why our plastics industry is as big as it is. I don't know the answer. That's a a little bit of a cynical response, but, but yeah, no, no it's <laughs> the listeners will understand. I, I don't know the history of a landfill either, unfortunately, but I also wish that I did just, I, I should have looked it up before this episode because that would be very, it, it just seems like during the industrial era, when sort of all of our modern systems came into, to be, like people were living in a very simple lifestyle. Like people definitely grew their own food and like maybe while they did throw it away in some way, shape or form, like I said, you know, neither of us know the history of this. So I'm just kind of guessing here, but like, there's definitely people who grew their own food and like grew their own like scraps into their yard and probably definitely knew how to compost and like how to turn old food scraps. So I'm just curious, like how that, large disconnect became and you know I'm wondering maybe people just didn't know the serious repercussions that would have come from putting everything into a landfill because I'm 27 and so when you tell me that a head of lettuce has been in a landfill entombed for as long as I've been alive you know my parents could have ordered lettuce or they sort of picked up lettuce from the grocery store like the day before my birth and then they like got had a baby and then like a week later the lettuce was bad it could have gone it, that could literally have happened yes <laughs> I think about this a lot where I'm like oh my gosh I'll have random flashbacks of plastic products that I've used or just you know growing up I'm like that Ziploc bag that I used to bring to school every yeah. day with a sandwich in it all of my Ziploc baggies are sitting in a landfill and they will outlive me by like hundreds and hundreds of years yeah no it's 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 really interesting and sad that we have come from like I don't I remember learning about World War II era people had victory gardens where they you know grew their food and and I think that we used to have and of course you know indigenous people way before Americans came to colonizers came to America there's we used to have such a a more intimate relationship with our food and how it get to us the growth process cultivating it harvesting it and just having much more of a connection to it and now you know in some ways certainly for better but also in a lot of ways for worse we the convenience of going to a grocery store and buying things pre-packaged and and all that stuff is we there's a distance between us and and how we get that food like we're not supposed to have you know, avocados year round here in Denver. We're not supposed to have, you know, fish here that are nowhere caught in our, you know, streams and lakes in Colorado, all sorts of examples like that. And so I think that, like you said, I think there's totally been a a distancing, a separation between us and, and the food that we eat. And I think that that has also contributed to this concept of throwing things away and how away is this, you know, far away place in our mind because we're not passing by a landfill every day and seeing what we're contributing to. We just throw it in the bin, someone picks it up and it's off of our minds. So a lot of contributing factors to to how we've gotten to where we are now. Um, well, if y'all ever just, since you were saying that the landfill is like away and out of your mind and, you know, the same thing sort of happens with my compost. Like I put my compost out, it's gone. Ta-da! I don't know where it goes. So if if Scraps ever wants to do a tour of A1 Organics for for people in the Denver community, I would absolutely join. I would absolutely bring some people along. Maybe we can email about that later. Yeah. But I would love to see where my composting goes and like see what the A1 Organics industrial composting factory turns that into. Because I know Mm -hmm. like for the um, municipal composting that gets turned into eco cycle right mm-hmm. eco yeah. grow eco yeah. grow okay eco cycle is a different yeah. program within the municipality but <laughs> yeah <laughs> eco grow okay. so yeah our our municipal compost is eco grow and i would just love to have more eyes on that process especially because it's like 
I recycle and I know that that can kind of be a broken chain and like it has broken in the past, which is why people are sort of skeptical of it now and different cities like same with composting allow different things like some do take clamshell containers some do not take same with chicken bones and real quick just just for you and the listeners since we were talking about like food in the grocery store like the avocados and things like that i have a previous episode with elizabeth bolus the ingredient insider and she is wicked smart and she gets really really into all of that with the grocery store but my trash so my boyfriend and i we compost and we recycle And then we have our regular trash of just, I don't even know what's in there really, except for like bags that things come in and uh, like just things that you just can't recycle pretty much because we, we throw everything in the compost now, but I don't have trash anymore. I basically don't have trash. Like they could actually come. And I really, I want to like see what we can do to make this actually happen, especially for people who have composting in their like seven or less homes. People don't need weekly trash pickup and Mm bi-weekly recycling pickup. We actually need weekly recycling pickup, weekly compost pickup and bi-weekly trash pickup because my trash came on Tuesday and granted we were out of town this week, but our trash comes every Tuesday and our compost comes every Wednesday. I didn't have any trash. I literally put the trash bin out and I opened it. I was like, did they come already? I just put the trash bin out. Did they come? What happened? We just didn't have any trash this week because we were out of town this weekend. I looked down in there to see what there was. There was like a few bags of dog poop. I know I've talked about dog poop a lot on this episode. And I think it's kind of relevant. <laughs> He's a little dog, so they're tiny bags. <laughs> but I had like two bags of those in there because I didn't want to put them inside the house one day. And then I had like, an Amazon, like terrible bag. And I was like, Oh my Mm -hmm. God. And then I looked at my compost bin and I had, you know, four of my tiny bags of compost. It has drastically reduced the amount of trash that we put out every week. There's maybe one or two bags of trash that definitely one, maybe two. Like, I don't even know if we have friends over or something, you know, but even, so we actually had friends over for friends giving we hosted 22 people in our house. Okay. That was a lot. I know like everyone can think of like 22 people that, you know, but to have everyone in your living room is like a lot. And after everyone got finished eating, um, my friend Bella and I, we made sure that all the food scraps went into the composting bins and we just like piled it out there. So I don't know if everyone was super busy after Thanksgiving, but it has drastically reduced the amount of trash that we have just from putting our food scraps in a different bin. Yeah. Yeah. There was, I mentioned this earlier on a bigger scale, kind of nationwide are the average city or the average resident sends 40% of what they send to the landfill is organic waste, so food scraps, et cetera. There was actually a, a study done in our city of Denver a couple of years ago, and they found that 50% of what residents throw in their trash in Denver can be composted. So I noticed the same thing that you just described when I started composting there. Don't take out my kitchen trash bin for, and it's, you know, it's a standard size trash bin. I probably take out one bag every maybe three weeks. And like you said, it's just, and it's mostly packaging from food, which I try to avoid, but in some cases I can't. And it's mostly plastic. While I'm on that note, I might take a moment to plug a new program that just came to Denver called Ridwell. They are awesome. They are a hard to recycle pickup service. So essentially in the same way that scraps works with your compost, you just set out a bin and, and we empty it. Ridwell does the same thing. You get a bin, you fill it with plastic film, which is by far the most, the category that I take advantage of the most. They also take batteries and light bulbs, old clothing that you can't donate, or maybe if you don't feel like donating it, and then they have like rotating categories. So highly recommend, really, really useful service. And even through using that, composting plus Ridwell taking a lot of my plastic film, I'm taking out the trash even less. So it's such a good feeling. And it's it's really nice to see that you're you're physically, you can see how much you are diverting from the landfill, which is just to me, helps me sleep at night. But to your point about our our city services, 
you are, I have talked to probably like a dozen people at this point with who are frustrated by the fact that our recycling only comes every other week and our trash comes every week. And yeah. I don't even roll my trash bin to the curb, maybe like once every six to eight weeks. It's just, I have a, I rent and I have a really, really big one and I will never, ever fill it up. And so all that to say, it kind of seems like the incentives are reversed in a way. Um, for our city for for waste diversion which is you know recycling and composting there is an initiative in i think it's up to city government at this point it's been kind of in the works across the state for a while but it's called pay as you throw and that is oh. yeah it's it's really cool it's a program for i think the initiative is just for the city and county of denver but the idea is that every household gets a recycling bin and a composting bin because right now, if you don't ask for the city's program, or obviously if you don't subscribe to a company like Scrap, you don't get it. And you have to pay extra. It's about $10 a month for the city's program, a little bit more for the Scrap program. And with this pay as you throw, every household would get recycling and composting for free. And then you would pay for your trash, depending on the size of your trash bin. The smaller the trash bin, the lower fee that you pay each month. So kind of putting the incentives in place to encourage people, hey, you should think about recycling and composting first and getting a smaller trash bin if you can, saving a little money. So that's, I think that's a pretty interesting initiative and could be pretty helpful. So, Yeah, I like that. I do wonder if they could like change the trash bin instead of like doing a size of the trash bin, because then I imagine they're going to have to create more smaller trash bins. And like, what would people do with all these large trash bins? If they can add like a, a weight measuring system onto like the trash yeah. pickup claw or something like that. I don't know, just, just a thought. Um, yeah. <laughs> so as far as the landfills go and like greenhouse gases, because composting is super relevant for combating methane in the atmosphere. And y'all talk about that a lot on your website, which I definitely appreciate. So on your website, it's just on the homepage, more than 1.5 million pounds of organic waste have been kept out of the landfill since 2017. And how does, and then it says this helps protect our climate, preventing tons of greenhouse gases, mainly methane from being emitted. And there's been over a million pounds of carbon dioxide equivalent. Yeah. How am I Cut trying to out. say this? Yeah. Taken out of the environment. Yeah. Because of yeah. composting with scraps, just scraps. Just crap. Yeah. So imagine, you know, everyone's composting efforts and the statistics behind that. It's, it's huge. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really wild. And I was actually trying to look into this yesterday. I got pretty deep into this like scientific report about methane emissions from landfills. And it was slightly over my head, even though I did learn a few things. So I don't know exactly how to quantify essentially the 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 amount of methane that our food waste contributes but I do know a couple things about landfills and methane and all that stuff so landfills if you were to essentially aggregate all of the landfills in America and kind of label it as like its own state landfills would be the third largest emitter of methane of any industry any place obviously a huge huge problem Methane itself, when compared to CO2, carbon dioxide, is 20 to 50 times more potent as a greenhouse oh. gas when released into our atmosphere. So it's 20 to 50 times better at capturing and retaining heat. So it's way more problematic. Oh. Um, landfills, like I mentioned earlier when we were talking about aerobic versus anaerobic, in that anaerobic landfill environment, the breakdown that does happen, which is at a smaller scale, when it does happen, it emits methane. That's the byproduct instead of kind of the byproduct we talked about in composting, which is the compost itself. The byproduct of decomposition in a landfill is methane. So a lot of landfills, this is so scary to me, but a lot of landfills are just constantly, constantly emitting methane and they actually pipe that methane out 
and a lot of landfills just have a burning pipe of methane that runs 24 hours a day, just burning a flame of methane into the atmosphere. Wow. Horrifying. So in it's not really fair. It's not really fair to like all the people who make videos about going vegan that are saying, you know, and cows, I, just because cows are relevant in the vegan videos, that's the only reason I talk about this. But like, you know, we're talking about how, how animals, cows fart, and they put out methane into the atmosphere. But a more practical thing that we all already do, we don't right. even have to like make a dietary change to reduce the amount of methane that's in the atmosphere, because that's really a, a big thing for a lot of people. You know, a dietary mm -hmm. change is like, some people are already on restricted diets and cannot make that change, for example, mm -hmm. or like, then you're having to say, okay, all the restaurants have to make the change. The industries have to make the change. Whereas if we just get everyone composting, that's reducing 40 to 50% of, of the things that are in the landfill. And, yeah. and correct me if I'm wrong, but does the food, so you're saying how the microbiomes in the composting turn into this really rich nutrient is it soil or just byproduct it's, it's i think the best way to refer to compost finished compost is the soil amendment so it's you wouldn't plant your plants directly in it you use it to infuse nutrients in your soil so it's amending your soil okay so it creates this amendment of soil that's really life-giving very nutrient rich amazing beautiful i let you called it beautiful earlier a beautiful product <laughs> Versus like <laughs> lettuce not decomposing. And so it's actually just releasing methane. Yeah. And, and then if the lettuce does decompose because it's in the landfill with like batteries and tampons, it's not a nutrient rich system either. It, it's at, or diapers or whatever. It's like full of, right. full of these other chemicals and like toxic leaks. Right. So yeah, com compost. <laughs> yeah. Compost. Yeah. We're not, when we send things to the landfill, we don't, uh, we're not attempting at any point to get them back in any way. There is some some efforts to capture the methane that is released from landfills. And I've kind of seen this kind of pop up more and more. And it's it's interesting because I don't think that that is the future. It's certainly, we mm -hmm. do not need to be sending more to the landfill to be able to get more methane. That's like so perverse in my mind. But, you know, if we can capture the methane that's already being emitted I guess why not that's cool but like you said to divert that waste is ultimately just apples and oranges like you there's no comparison in my mind of the two diverting yeah. them creating compost and and the various applications of compost is just beneficial whereas sending things to landfill is in no way beneficial so the the use of compost as well, the composting process when our food waste is being decomposed and, and digested by these microorganisms, um, that whole process itself, there are very, very, very few emissions from just like the digestion. And the emissions that do occur are multiple times offset by the benefits that come from compost. This is actually one of the things I read about in that um, article I read yesterday. Okay, great. Um, which I already knew, but I kind of got a little bit more of like scientific backing when I was reading that. But applying compost, as I mentioned earlier, is obviously the benefit is if you've ever applied it to your, to your garden or to your house plants, it is a fertilizer itself because it is so nutrient rich. In a lot of cases, applying compost means that you do not have to apply any sort of artificial fertilizers at all. And there's growing movement around what's called regenerative agriculture, which is essentially a collection of practices to help us better manage our lands and move away from harmful practices like tilling, but also using pesticides and herbicides that end up in our plants, in our water, etc. So compost over time, is even on huge, huge acres of land, you know, industrial agriculture settings can eventually, with these other regenerative practices, take the place of needing to use pesticides and herbicides and fertilizers and all that stuff. Um, like I mentioned earlier, this is a really, really important point. Another plug that I will put in here for another documentary that I also could not recommend more, it's called Kiss the Ground. It's on Netflix. It was another one that just blew my mind. Absolutely. My jaw was just 
for like two hours afterwards I was like I can't even believe how amazing this was so definitely go watch kiss the ground the 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 benefits of regenerative agriculture and composting which is a key component of regenerative agriculture are just are almost incomprehensible if we were to manage our our lands in this way using compost allowing our soils to infiltrate more water and absorb and hold more water fighting droughts it is a holistic way of managing lands. You mentioned earlier cows and methane emissions from like burping and farting. That is a big problem. And part of the reason that's a big problem is because of the way that we manage our cattle. The We have them in what's called concentrated CAFO, something, I forget the A. <laughs> Someone's probably like cringing hearing this. I think it's concentrated animal feed operations. And that's if you've ever been driving or if you've seen these like vegan videos, any videos where you see animals in these packed lots just with no green space, that is such a concentration of, of emissions, methane, et cetera. There is a way to, it's called managed grazing. You can integrate animals and nature coexist before humans came in and, and disrupted things. And, and you know we thought that we had a better idea by separating the two. If you combine animals and land management, there it's a beautiful synergy that happens. And anywho, I won't get into it because that's not my area of expertise, but we'll watch the video. Watch. Yeah, we have totally. to watch the video to know what it is that you're leaving us on the cliff for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what happens there? Recommend. Well, Alexa, I know we're we're at we're like past our original designated time. So I just want to ask you one more question before I let you go. And thank you for staying a little bit over. I love it. <laughs> Where, what are Scrap's goals for the future? So like, is your goal to have composting in everyone, a compost bin in like all the apartments downtown or like, what are y'all's goals? Yes, I think right now our net is cast pretty wide when it comes to our goals. We have, because the city of Denver has the municipal program that we've referenced a couple of times, we're hoping that that program expands just for the city's sake and you know for humanity's sake. Um, but until that happens, we definitely are focused on upping our numbers, both residential and commercial, in the city of Denver. And then over the past two years, we've really been trying to focus on the kind of surrounding suburbs of Denver too, who don't have access to any sort of municipal service. So we have increased our, our service area for our, our pickup residential service to Lakewood, Wheat Ridge, Broomfield, Arvada. We're kind of moving more in the west, western direction, Westminster. Yeah. And um, I live in Golden. Wheat Ridge. I'm in Wheat Ridge. So I totally appreciate that y'all have done that because when I moved out here, I, I lost my ability to compost mm -hmm. that I had previously yeah. been doing. So yeah, thank yeah. you. <laughs> oh my gosh, thank you. So yeah, we we want to get as many people composting as possible. We are being approached. We actually, uh, just kind of a little bit of a backstory. We started off scrap. Downtown Denver was kind of our headquarters and we started as a bike based company. So we used to do all of our collections on bikes and electronic trikes. We loved that. And we actually held on to those for over three years, maybe four years. And only recently outgrew those and decided that we had to become vehicle-based because we were just handling so much volume. And so a little bit bittersweet, but now we actually recently just purchased our first commercial CDL truck. So just picture like your standard trash truck. We have one of those now for compost, oh, which cool. is just something that I don't think either, and no one on our team really ever envisioned happening. So we are definitely growing. We're always looking for momentum. We're always looking for new areas to bring our service. So if anyone listening is interested in composting, feel free to look us up, scrapsmilehigh.com. Reach out to me. My email should be on the website. Um, but yeah, tell your friends about composting. We have drop-off programs as well. So if you don't happen to live in our service area, or if you'd rather just be able to drop off your compost anytime, that's a separate membership that we offer. We have locations all around town. So yeah, just keeping our eye on growth and trying to spread the composting gospel as it were. <laughs> I love that. 
I, so I need to email you about taking, organizing a tour to the A1 organics and I need to email you about maybe expanding some compost in, in a different state. So yes, absolutely. Okay. Let's see what you got. (laughs) Yeah. Our conversation is not finished, but it is finished for this podcast. Thank you so much for being here, Alexa. I really appreciate your time and for informing us about what composting is, science behind it. And I love the science behind it. And thank you for being a member of Scraps and helping organize all that and bringing composting to people outside of the Denver city. Thank you so much for having me. It's always fun to have conversations like this. I love your questions. I love getting into the nitty gritty stuff. This was really fun. Podcast listeners, thank you so much for listening to today's show. I really hope you learned something new from your go-to podcast on all things eco-friendly in the home. I'm your host, Madison Hopkins, and I am signing off. If you'd like to contact me, email me, madison at movingwithmadison.com. And remember to hit subscribe so you can get notified every second and fourth Wednesday of the month on how to live more eco-friendly in your home. And I'll see y'all next time.